members of the LGBTQ plus community are of God. Good. You don't associate with them. But don't try to diminish somebody's humanity in Jesus' name because you don't understand the complexity of God's creativity. Every group that Jesus begins to, to identify are marginalized, oppressed, disenfranchised people. And something then that we have to see as a common thread of prophetic ministry <clears throat> throughout the scriptures and throughout the word of God, even coming to and through the life of Jesus Christ, is the commitment to be the voice for those who had no voice, but deeper than that, to be the voice of God on behalf of those who did not have the power, on behalf of those who were found in a lesser position to those who were using their power to oppress and suppress those different groups of people. And I was in an interview the other day and, and said, my goodness, how have we gotten it so backwards today where now the church has become in many cases and instances the oppressor has become the system that oppresses people and then has become the the very seat of the same spirit of the pharisees that shut up the kingdom of god so jesus said he rebuked these pharisees and said you hypocrites you shut up the kingdom of god from these people and you yourself will not be found in it how accurate and so depictive of the moment we find ourselves in today that, that we would be hard pressed in Pentecost and in holiness to uh, uh, spend any measure of time in Pentecost and holiness without uh, sending, without love and compassion, sending every member of the LGBTQ plus community to hell while pastors and leaders abuse and exploit the name of God uh, and abuse and exploit God's people to serve their own interests and it should concern us. And so to share a lost prophetic word from one of the greatest revivalists in America's history because I really believe we're at a specific moment in time. And he said, we're hippies, we're the unreachable, untouchable, misunderstood by the church of their day, and they became the fiery logs of the Jesus movement revival. The gay community would be the next great worldwide move of God catalyst. They feel unreachable by most Christians who disagree with their culture and their lifestyle now, but God's going to raise up revivalists and salvation and a move of the Holy Spirit from the LGBTQ plus community. I feel like it's the biggest fundamental mistake that the black church has made towards the LGBTQ community. Well, I, you know, before it even, we even talk about the LGBTQI community, okay. uh, you know, we don't have a fundamental conversation about sexuality mm -hmm. in general. Uh, even just heterosexuals talking to each other mm -hmm. about sexuality, about family, about emotions. I think sometimes we still have struggles. I, I do think the world is changing. Yes, mm -hmm. it is. You know, we're in a time now where people are more uh, open about mm -hmm. their perspectives and, and thoughts and, and feelings. But I think we have to start with addressing sexuality and looking at the ways in which we've put stigma sure. on certain conversations yes, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, because we've looked at the Bible, our religion, our God in certain types of ways. Mm -hmm. it, we, we have to figure out how to have that conversation. The limelight is about to be on you in a way you've never seen. Wait. And God is going to demand a high level of integrity from you. He's going to start pulling on you, Jamal, in ways you've never been pulled on before. Because in all of your imperfections, in all of your character issues that you work through, you've always said yes to God. But recently, there has been a different battle against you. And I hear God saying as clear as day, the next six months of your life are going to be very challenging because you're going to be placed in a position where you finally find out how much influence you really have. I am here because the black church 
owes this community an apology. And uh, I wanted to come tonight uh, not just uh, as pastor of New Birth. I wanted to come for the pastors who have hurt you. Many of us have needed that. And not, not just, not just um, those of us who are in the LGBTQ community, specifically the trans community, and women, black women in the black church that comprise the majority um, have needed this level of, of conversation. And I want to say thank you for um, having the courage to do that. And I, you know, I, I've experienced the backlash in a certain kind of way as well. And I just, I guess we're just going to talk, right? Yeah. Can we just talk? I guess we are here. We are here, y'all. We are here. Because there are people within our community that struggle with the fact that we wanted a mainstream leader in the space, right? And because so many of us have been hurt, abused, and brutalized, um, people have questioned my intent. Right? But as I said to you, somebody has to be the bridge. And as yes, sir. you have articulated, somebody has to be the bridge. And so we're seeking to be a bridge. So what does that mean? Um, as we move forward in this, you know, as I was going to say at the end, I was going to ask you, you know, are you open to having even more dialogue with us? Um, and with people in our community. Uh, but I, what I want to know is, what is your vision for the bridge? What does it mean to you? I, I think that uh, the gospel in and to itself is controversial. Uh, and the Americanized gospel Come on now. has put us in a place where we want to be liked. Yeah, talk. But nothing in Christendom comes with affirmation. Uh, but we want to be coddled uh, to know that it is okay. Faith is synonymous with risk. Uh, and most people are not prepared to take any risk, and yet they claim to be Christian. Uh, so it's, uh, it's only one that got out of the boat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on now. Want to uh, thank you for going where, uh, quite frankly, I shouldn't be in this seat, Bishop, because I am not one of the spiritual fathers. I'm your brother. I, so the fathers of mainline denominations need to have this conversation. Uh, how, how much is missing from coaching because of this? I'm not just missing from PAA because of this. I'm not just missing from Bible way because of this. Talked about um, in the uh, pandemic, they emerged the phraseology of toxic masculinity. Uh, but we do not talk about fragile masculinity. Uh, and fragile masculinity is can I hug and embrace you without questioning my own sexual identity? So uh, talk, Dr. Uh, no, Bryant. With their own Nicodemus syndrome, they have to see behind come on, closed dog. doors. Yes! I deal with their own suppressed closet uh -huh. lifestyle. Uh -huh. Of sin. The three dimensions of sin are thought, word, and deed. 
Yes, sir. Yeah. The black church only focuses on deeds. On deeds. But there are a whole lot of mental homosexuals. But they're not practicing, but they're thinking. And because of that, they can't have their conversations. Okay? They don't have a relationship, but they have a porn site. So we're to be working on all of those different barriers and all different levels. So it may have to be a closed door meeting to work out those workers before we can come out of the public space. I'm hoping that this is that first step uh, towards uh, towards doing that. Because I think that with criminal criminology and the data, uh, most people who are victims of domestic violence, you are wounded or beat up or abused by who you live with. Uh, it's because that's who's closest. And so the black church beats up the LBGTQ community because you're close. Don't, don't, don't preach on just what you don't have an issue with. Shakespeare said to thine own self be true. Uh, and so I think the word said it is that we understand that all of us are struggling with something. All of us are dealing with something. All of us have come through something. Then we're able to see through the prism called grace. Yeah. We, we don't like grace when it's not ours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah so we, we don't hear sermons on gluttony from fat preachers. <laughs> You don't hear uh, a greed uh, from uh, preachers whose closets are burst like. Yes. They, they only preach on what they don't struggle with. Oh. Or, or with they what, they do. what they do struggle with. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, and so I think that we have to have a real come to Jesus meeting, uh, Bishop, that uh, would involve you being in rooms like the National Council of Black Churches. Uh, you, you are not a rogue organization. Uh, you bring actual churches and bodies that are voting blocks that deserve a seat at the table. Instead of bringing a message in the pulpit, we bring a grievance. And oftentimes... Wait, hold. Instead of bringing a message into the pulpit, the preachers are bringing their grievances. Wow. Well, and so they're bleeding on the people. Going into the lion's den, telling the folk that are bound, we apologize for the church on behalf of the church. Devil is a liar with your master. I don't care how two men marry each other. They can't, I don't care how many surgeons they go to, honey, they can, the surgeon can't outdo God. That surgeon came, twist the woman, the man's anatomy, and tuck it and fold it enough to feel like the natural body of a woman. Man, you ain't got what I got. It don't feel like how I feel. You ain't nothing but a lie. The devil is a liar with your master set. You ain't got a, I might be fat. But I'm warm and fine and tender and gentle. Oh, you can't touch this, can you, Mark? Oh, Mark Hinton, you can't touch this, can you? Hallelujah! Let the church say hallelujah. You can't outdo God, baby. Can't no man kiss another man like a woman can. Come on, when I snuggle up to you and put my arms around you, it's going to make you want to kiss. Two hard-legged men rubbing on one another. It's an abomination to God and to nature. The devil is a liar. It's a myth. It's a fantasy. It is a lie. Sweet. Come on. Don't let another woman tell you that she can do for you what a man can. And that's how they get to you. They start doing good things for you and 
spending the night at your house and they full of seducing spirits and come on here somebody amen and they you know it, it's easier for two women to hide than it is for two men come on here somebody but God see you and I see you come on here somebody I don't care what that other woman strap on her body it ain't what God gave a man the devil is a liar y'all need to go home and get rid of these old toys and mess you done picked up in the porno houses got you masturbating yourself come on you gonna cause cancer down there Ah, oh, come on here somebody the devil is a liar look at your neighbor and say if you're doing it you're nasty it's nasty it ain't none of God it's filthy come on somebody the devil is an abosha I'm preaching the gospel of abosha you know God is love come it's not on, just that God loves you mm -hmm. but God is love yes. and we have to start from a very fundamental place about God's love toward us and that we are uh, created in the image of God yes. and why would God create something that is flawed or wrong or bad we got to start we got to start there I think the second thing is you know you ask people why do you believe what you believe and they say well that's what I was taught mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know we have to ask questions right we've got to read the Bible if that is your sacred text if sure. you're a Christian uh, you have to read it for yourself right yes. and and I believe that God helps us to interpret and to understand uh, but I, you can't just go by what somebody told you or the way you were raised. We have to have the courage to learn on our own yes. and sure. then move uh, to a new place. That's the so courage. That is, that is really, really uh, very important because you have two children. Yes. Six and five. And I have two yes. children as well. And Kaylee I want and them Joshua. To, yeah. <laughs> and I want them to really uh, be able to explore their spirituality yes. and not have to uh, be confined That's to right. what has been taught to them That's and right. what's been taught generationally. Yeah. Six truths that the Bible says about the homosexuality. Number one, homosexuality was not God's intention for sexual expression. Number two is the homosexual practice brought judgment upon Sodom and Gomorrah. Homosexual behavior is condemned in the Bible as an abomination. The practice of homosexuality is called an unnatural state rooted in the fallen human nature. Number five is practicing homosexuals will not inherit the kingdom of God. Not, not those Christians who struggle with homosexuality, but those who identify themselves as gay. They're no longer finding their identity in Christ. They're finding their identity in their sexuality. Number six is homosexuals can be saved like every other sinner. First, Number one, Sodom and Gomorrah is not about same gender love. And when we talk about same gender love, if you equate same gender love to violent acts, you have disrespected the conversation. Him loving him is not the same as a mob of men trying to rape somebody. And if we would have open and honest conversation about human sexuality, we have to detach it from violence and stereotypes. This is not about rape. This is not about pedophilia. This is not about hypersexuality. This is not about spreading HIV and AIDS. You've got to dismiss the violence. But whatever position you take on whatever issue you look at, can you do me a favor? Can you not base that on one scripture? Because it goes down in Genesis 19, but in Ezekiel 16, God addresses it. Listen to what the Lord says. He says, let me tell you why I destroyed Sodom. Let me tell you the sins of Sodom. He says this, listen, here's the sin of Sodom. They were full of pride. They had a fullness of food. There was an abundance of idleness. And they didn't do anything to help the poor and the needy. That's why I got rid of them. They had pride, a fullness of food, an abundance of idleness. They didn't care about the poor and the needy. Then in verse 50, God says, and they committed abomination. All right, we can spend all day talking about what that abomination was.
Biblically, an abomination is something that God hates because it is offensive to him and his character. Anything that robs God of his honor is an abomination. Abomination and abominations appear 152 times in the NKJV Bible, and there are 97 Bible verses regarding abomination in the KJV. With that being said, there are many things that are an abomination to God. But here's what the truth is. The abomination is not the first nor the only thing on the list of what displeased God. The God said, listen, if you want to know the truth about Sodom, before you get to all of this and who was sleeping with whom, that wasn't my first issue. My first issue was that they were proud. They had a fullness of food and an abundance of idleness and they didn't care for the poor and the needy. My real issue with Sodom, they didn't take care of the poor and the needy. I want to talk about the reformed babes. Genesis 1, mm -hmm. who says that she was a lesbian, she's not a lesbian no more, God delivered her. Also, um, Sophia, Sophia Ruffin. There's also Jackie Hill. Mm -hmm. She says I was a lesbian and now she's got married. So if my gay is in my flesh or my hum humanity, mm -hmm. is my gay a demon or devil? Well, I have been a same gender loving woman or well, young woman when I was about um, the story goes back, um, it's kind of lengthy, but I remember, and this is not an excuse, but just kind of trying to, um, give our listeners, um, a better understanding as to why I am so passionate about this. Um, I was a young girl, probably like seven, eight years old, and I was molested several times, um, inside of a church, um, by a um, mission evangelist, missionary. Um, that's what they call them, the organization that I was in. And I, of course, now I know then I just really wasn't sure as to what was taking place. Um, but my feelings and my emotions just wasn't the same as a normal young girl my age. Um, and so my mother, and I say this all the time, my mother, very saved woman, kind, very compassionate. Um, but that baby boomer generation, they felt that affection was for their spouse. You know, so my mama still to this day, you know, gonna give me a church hug and, you know, God bless you or whatever. And sometimes I'm like, uh, I don't want that, but I get it. You know, that generation feels that affection is for your spouse. And so when I became of age. I was actually in high school. I think I was like in the 10th grade and very popular girl. She was on the basketball team and she affirmed me. Um, she showed me healthy. Well, what I thought was healthy affection, but it was definitely perverted affection. But she showed me a measure of affection that I was missing from my home. And so that within itself, excuse me, um, that within itself actually took me on a journey. And I don't think back then we had the you know, the letters LGBTQIA, um, we didn't have that back then, but I was a, a same gender loving um, young woman. And the thing that I love about my mother was that when other, you know, because I grew up in a very strict um, holiness Pentecostal environment, but one thing about my mom, when other people were putting their children out or exiling them from the family, my mother stood by me. And I tell people today that it was nothing but love that lifted me. Um, and of course my mother did not agree and she made that, um, very known, but it was something I had to go through and deliverance for me was one day I did not spit up in a bucket. I did not go on a fast. One day I woke up and realized that I was living a lie. Um, I started pastoring here in Atlanta. We started plowing in 2000, the end of 2018. But we launched a church in February 2020 and I am from Memphis, Tennessee. So I am um, from the Kojic headquarters, you know, gay, gay, beat them down, beat them down. You know, you're going to hell and it's just pretty much it. Um, but when I started pastoring here, it was a culture shock, Bishop. I was mm -hmm. 
I mean, you had, you know, transsexuals that was coming to church and they were shouting and dancing and praising God. And, you know, they saying they prophet this and prophet is this and apostle this. And I'm like, whoa, I was literally in a culture shock. Um, we launched literally one month before the pandemic um, was declared over America. And so uh, every church closed, God told me to remain open. And so, of course, people that like church and people that were needing encouragement and needed to be healed and delivered, they came to Dominion. And so um, I didn't realize it, but people were telling me, you know, hey, you know, you got same sex couples that's hugged up in church. Now I'm in the front trying to hear God. You know, when I get up, I'm releasing the word of the Lord. I'm not paying attention to certain things that's happening. Um, but then when I was when people start bringing into my consciousness, I will go back to the replay and I'm like, wow, these men are sitting up here bold, hugged up with their lovers, shouting with their lovers. When you try to pray for the lover, they make themselves the adjutant, the armor bearer and the security guard. Like your partner can't even get a breakthrough because you didn't made yourself on, you know, a part of the altar workers of the ministry. So it was a lot. And so me, I'm like, hey, let me get out and let me go out and tell these people you're going to hell X, Y, and Z. Um, but then I had to go to the Lord because I said, okay, God, we have been sending gays to hell um, since the days of Bishop Mason, I'm sure. Um, and clearly that is not the antidote. That is not an answer. And so I believe that God literally raises up um, people for the time um, that they're called to reform and to bring change and to release the kingdom. And so I went to God and the Lord began to talk to me about human sexuality. And he began to tell me that the gospel of Jesus Christ is for all. It's for the Jew. It's for the Gentile. And I think in the church where we failed is that we've made this, oh, well, this applies to the gays and this apply to the heterosexual when the words of Jesus Christ is for all of humanity. Maybe they're homosexual spirits. There's no such thing as the spirit of homosexuality left me now, I'm free, I'm, I no longer have it. It's not like that. There is a program in the mind that is still there. And I've done it all. You know, I've, I've did the drugs. I've been with men. I've been with women at all. All of it. All of it comes out. And Are you serious? Every, every bit of it. That's my line. That, it's not a line. It's my life. That I think to make it a gay, gay, gay conversation, gay is overrated. It's again a work of the flesh, and right. and what this could also show mm. is that um, a lot of times um, preachers mm -hmm. that when we have unresolved mm -hmm. situations that are in our life, mm -hmm. instead of bringing a message in the pulpit, we bring a grievance, and it's, oftentimes we hold instead of bringing a message into the pulpit, the preachers are bringing their grievances. Wow. Oh. And so they're bleeding on the people. Mm. Right? So there were men of God that uh, I've said under that preach so hard against certain sins to only find out in the latter end of their life that was the sin that they were wrestling with. Yeah. And it was manifesting itself. God. That's, 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 that's a spiritual crime. Bringing Jesse Lee Peterson is gay. All right? He was on the show. He started to bash members of the LGBTQ community in the bullpen. And I kicked him off the program. Now multiple individuals that he has sexual relationships with, they did a full interview about their encounters with him over many years. And the involvement that he has had with many men during his tenure as the head of Bond, which is an organization dedicated, according to preacher Jason Lee Peterson, an organization that is supposed to rebuild men. Now, remember, there is no issue with Jesse Lee Peterson being gay, in my opinion, whatsoever. The issue is his hypocrisy. This man has literally made a life and monetized off of bashing members of a community that he's actually a part of. Preachers in the pulpit, you men preachers, that I don't know whether you a man or a woman. You men preachers, that your sexuality is in question because you dyeing your hair like you's a woman. Be delivered 
All this mixture in the body of Christ. You women who dress like men, bull daggers. Y'all, God is calling the church back to their first love. This mixture is in the body of Christ and maybe I've contributed to it. The pastors at Steadfast Baptist Church now based in Watauga have a history of anti-gay rhetoric and that continued on Sunday when Pastor Dylan Oz gave a statement calling for the execution of gay people. This is audio from part of that sermon. They should be convicted in a lawful trial. They should be sentenced with death. They should be lined up against the wall and shot in the back of the head. That's right. That's what God teaches. Stop it. Get some help. What? The Bible says, Leviticus 20, 13. If a man also lie with mankind as he lieth with the woman, okay, it says, even both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. And that, my friend, is the cure for aid. It was right there in the Bible all along. And they're out spending billions of dollars and research and testing. It was, it's curable right there because if you executed the homos like god recommends you wouldn't have all this aids running rampant See, i just apologize i'm sorry i'm sorry to anyone who's hurt by those words because that's not who jesus was according to a first of its kind study by the anti-defamation league and the advocacy group glad between june of 2022 and april of 2023 there were 356 targeted assaults acts of harassment and or vandalism against the LGBTQ community in the U.S. The Bible's again it. God's again it. I'm again it. In a and recent sermon, it, the Baptist pastor, again. Charles Worley, suggested gays and lesbians should be imprisoned behind an electric fence. In a few years, they'll die out. Do you know why they can't reproduce? So your little son starts to act a little girlish. Another pastor, also in North Carolina, recently apologized after he told parents to slap children they suspect of being gay. The second you see your son dropping the limp wrist, you rock over there and crack that wrist. They shun the love of God. Reverend Billy Ball supports his colleague's view that homosexuality is a sin. Sodomy has always been an abomination, both Old and New Testament, and has always been, in God's view, punishable by death. But the Southern Baptist Convention, which oversees many churches in the American South, is distancing itself from the pastors and their views. These were some of the most irresponsible, uh, uninformed, and quite frankly, unchristian comments I've heard from a pastor in a while. Um, because it does really impact the reputation that all of Christianity has in the world. So my question, and my question to everybody who tries to say that, oh, you shouldn't be, you know, Christian because you're gay. Why are you trying to turn people away from God? Enough already with this gay Christian stuff. To me, yesterday was one of the most bizarre scenes I ever seen in this city. One of the most comedic scenes I ever witnessed in public. When I witnessed men with size 13, 14 shoes out there kissing each other in the mouth in front of little kids, it was just bizarre. It was like a freak scene going on. That's what I call it. Now, I know about the government and laws being made, but I got a law this morning that came out of Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 31. And it says, shall a man leave his mother and father and join to his wife, and they shall become one. And to have your kids out there yesterday, six, seven years old, holding flags, the Bible said, provoke not your children. Tariah, Tariah, Proverbs 22 and verse 6, 7, train up a child in the right way he should go. And when he get old, he wouldn't depart. And I have, a, I have a scripture too. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For me, it's like work on yourself. Because while you're working on yourself, you'll realize that you're not so great what I believe that the scripture says, that, that homosexuality is a sin. So, you know, I believed it before and I still believe it now. Again, I would just reiterate what I said. I'm not after, I'm not mad at anybody. I don't dislike anybody, but, you know, you know, respecting my faith and believing, you know, in, in what the scripture says, that's the best way I can interpret it. To 700 Kenyan evangelical pastors have written an open letter asking the president not to talk about the gay agenda. We do not want him to come and talk on homosexuality in Kenya or push us to accepting, to accepting that, which is against our faith and our culture. 
Makariuki is the key architect of that letter. He leads an alliance representing 38,000 churches and 10 million Kenyan Christians. He welcomes the president's visit, but says leave the gay talk in America. Ser homosexual no es un delito. Es una condición humana. Somos todos hijos de Dios. Y Dios nos quiere como estamos y con la fuerza que luchamos cada uno por nuestra dignidad. El ser homosexual no es un delito. No es un delito. Sí, pero es pecado. Bueno, primero, distingamos pecado por delito. Pero también es pecado la falta de caridad con el prójimo. ¿Y vos cómo andás? I think this is a great time to be reminded of what the Catholic Church stands on. So I'm going to read right from the Catechism, number 2358. It says, the number of men and women who have deep-seated homosexual tendencies is not negligible. The Church is saying it's not to be ignored. Do not ignore people who are struggling, right? It says, this inclination, which is objectively disordered, constitutes for most of them a trial. This is huge, you guys. It says, this inclination which is objectively disordered. It doesn't say this person is disordered. And I think we need to remind ourselves and others that we can separate a person from their desires or even their actions and see them as God sees them, see the person in front of us. And Local church, I believed that being gay was somehow wrong. I love my daughter and I thought I had to protect her. So I said, Annie, don't give in, we'll support you. How can I help? As I hung up the phone, my heart sank. I knew we'd never be the same in the church again. Later, at Bible study, I shared with some of my closest friends, hoping they'd give me some wisdom. Instead, they just went straight to the rules. They said, being gay is a sin and you can't accept it. <laughs> Not accept my daughter? What does that even mean? I was devastated. I realized I was being asked to choose between the two most important parts of my life, my child and my church. I chose my child. And eight years later, half our family still doesn't speak to us. My faith was fraying at the edges. I needed to understand this. And what does the Bible even really say about it anyway? I needed to understand and I began to read everything I could. I even went to seminary. <laughs> and I learned that most Christians do accept LGBTQ people. Yeah. One young man came out to his parents and they put all his belongings on the lawn and set them on fire. Another received a, a delivery of black roses from his family to say he was dead to them. And one young woman stepped out of her college library to find her parents on the corner, waving Bibles and shouting, God hates fags. Can you imagine? And these parents think this is love. They call it tough love. They've been told that they're loving their children by shaming and shunning them and seeking to make them straight. But I know what love feels like, and that is not love. Real love. It was New Year's Eve and my work cell phone rang and I was annoyed, but I answered it. And my friends immediately started teasing me that I was running a, a gay crisis hotline. But when I answered, I heard this scared kid and he said, my name is Sean. My dad kicked me out because I'm gay and I don't know anyone, please don't hang up on me. So I listened patiently as Sean told me his story, which unfortunately was not unique to me. On his 18th birthday, Sean's dad said, no son of mine is gonna be like that and live in this house, so pack your bags. He drove Sean down to Charleston from Delaware so that he could be homeless in a warm climate. He said it was because he loved him so Sean still had a whole year left of high school, if that puts it into context for you. But here he was abandoned, and he's freezing, and he's terrified of the older guys who were calling him the F word. You know the one, it rhymes with maggot. For young people who identify as LGBTQ+, 
Coming out could literally mean risking the roof over their head. I had family issues when it came to me to knowing who I was and they didn't like the way the the way I was because I didn't live up to their expectations of how they wanted me to be. Like many, she left home with just a tendril of hope for a better life. I ended up getting kicked out. I ended up sleeping in parks and like the streets and stuff and it wasn't a good place for me. experiencing the rejection and abandonment from family members can also, unfortunately, in the most extreme and tragic instances, um, result in life ending consequences. And so there's a link between suicide um, and homelessness. Uh, but we also see high rates of depression, anxiety, um, high risk behavior. Life in prison, even the death penalty for being gay. In Uganda tonight, that's reality after President Yoweri Museveni signed one of the world's most draconian anti-gay laws. <laughs> triggering an international backlash, threats of punishment from the U.S., and fears of other African nations following Uganda into an LGBT crackdown. This is not where I would like to be. This Ugandan LGBT activist had to flee their country, now living in exile. You are arresting us for literally doing nothing, for simply existing. You know, but where are we supposed to go? How did we become refugees in our own countries? The new law punishes gay sex with a life sentence for the crime of promoting homosexuality 20 years. It was watered down from an earlier version that criminalized merely identifying as LGBTQ. But this version imposes even harsher penalties for what it calls aggravated homosexuality, same-sex relations involving children, people with HIV, or other vulnerable people. When you God decided male and female. I, no, 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 I'm not, this is not a bad, I need y'all to hear my heart on this. This is not a bashing, this is not a, he, if I was there, maybe I would have told him, is there something in the middle you could do? Like kind of a, like a little maybe if somebody, well, I was born like this, I don't know how I feel. That I, I feel you. Jesus did not say one single word of condemnation about anyone based on sexual orientation. Yes. You know, you ask people, why do you believe what you believe? And they say, well, that's what I was taught. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, we have to ask questions. Right. We've got to read the Bible if that is your sacred text, if sure. you're a Christian. Uh, you have to read it for yourself. Right. You think being gay is a choice? Absolutely. Is homosexuality a choice? Yes, the issue was resolved last week by retired neurosurgeon and GOP presidential candidate Ben Carson. Funny or Die News hit the streets to find out more. I'm still deciding uh, whether to be Asian or black, so I haven't even come close to that yet. Hopefully someday. Oh, I'm on parole, so I haven't been gay for a few months, but uh, I could end up gay again if I slip up. When did you decide to become gay? Just now. On Harris for Funny or Die News, I decided I was gay when I was 13 years old, mostly to piss off my dad, but then I forgot to switch back. Well, like, that's what you're saying about, like, you don't think it's a choice to be homosexual? I don't think it can be from yeah. my point of view. Yeah. Imagine, like, growing up, because from our uh, like point of view as a straight male, mm -hmm. and we, yeah. we grew up and we were born into this world and we, like, were attracted to women, yeah. right? So imagine being like born a man and just being born attracted to men yeah. and right. having people say, right. You know, it's, it's gotta be pretty frustrating. Oh yeah, definitely. You know, like, yeah. hundred like, percent. You know, looking at it from their point of view, it's like someone, if someone told you like, it's a choice for you to like women, it's like, well, it's just what I'm attracted to. Uh -huh. yeah. like, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah. so I, it's, it's a very. See, but that's what I'm saying though. People who are even question, like if they even think that it's a choice, yeah. that means they can't, they're probably thinking about it for themselves. Sure. Cause like, or they're not thinking, they're yeah. just saying like, but anyone who really thinks it's a choice, just um, ask yourself this, would you be able to choose to be attracted to a guy? If or a girl? A guy. Yeah, if you're a guy. Would you be choose to be attracted to the same sex? Cause if you, if you can, then you really shouldn't be ar making that argument because you're probably gay. John in Chardon, Ohio says homosexuals are born that way and they're children of God. They certainly are children of God. And I think uh, male homosexuals uh, okay. are largely born that way. I don't think that it's uh, genetic, but it might be hormonal in the womb.
female homosexual is a much more complex issue because female sexuality can go in all directions. Some oh boy. are wait, indeed. Wait, wait a second. Like, <laughs> we just stop there. I just like I'm just trying to understand what this means. M male homosexuals. He's, I'm afraid to saying, ask what the data say, said. Like, male homosexuals. This is even saying that it's just like, oh my God, is this 1952? <laughs> and uh, this is like, uh, I'm in a, uh, I'm in a, I'm in a scientist outfit, <laughs> looking at <that> pornography. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> male homosexuals, it may be hormonal in the womb, and so they're 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 born that way. But female sexuality, I think he's saying, can go in any different direction. <laughs> Which, okay. All right, let's say it's going 360. Um, they're born that well, way, too. Male sexuality, right? which can, it can only go in the It can only go, it can, it's like it can go 180, like 180 and what, like, like that way. But, but female but sexuality can go like this. Hang on, let me stop you right here. First of all, choice and genetic are not the only options. There are a lot of things that make you you that you didn't choose but are also not genetic. He stills dated March 2015 purport to show a man being thrown from a building. According to the last caption, he was also then stoned to death, his alleged crime being gay. These images were posted by ISIS in its stronghold of Raqqa. This series as well, from January, show an older man seated in a chair and then tumbling to the ground. Also in January, these from ISIS in Mosul, two men murdered in the same manner. Since the 1980s, testosterone in men has been decreasing at a rate of 1% every year. In 1980, the average testosterone was 500. In the 1990s, it was 425. In the early 2000s, it was 325. Somebody was telling me about his son had a testosterone at 85. You see a man who has issues with low testosterone, going to start to see balding, erectile dysfunction, lose muscle mass, inability to build muscle too. That's going to change how you look too, bro. Gynecomastia is a development of man boobs. American food is banned in Europe. Certain food companies here, if they decide to sell their food in Europe, they have to change the ingredient. That's why you have a Mexican Coca-Cola. The ingredients, they won't allow high fructose corn syrup in their country. Pesticides are another issue because if you're eating processed food, you're eating pesticides. And the second most prevalent pesticide is atrazine. You probably heard the study where the male frog was converted into a female frog. The men parts were disappearing. And that's the second most common pesticide in the U.S., which is banned in Europe. The largest chemical company in the world asked me to use my expertise in studying frog hormones to try to understand if the chemical, their number one selling product, a weed killer, atrazine, if it interfered with their hormones so, somehow. Long story short, we examined the African clawed frog in my lab, we exposed them to this chemical atrazine, and we showed things like this, and these are testes, and you don't have to have a PhD or be a frog expert to see that there's a difference between the control and the exposed animals. The control testes, if you look at it under the microscope, it's full of sperm soldiers ready to go. The atrazine-treated gonad or testes, the testicular tubules are filled with cellular debris. What's more is if you look at the young developing larvae, you often find sometimes, uh, these are the kidneys, if you're not used to looking at frog gonads, that this is an individual, though, that has testes, then it has more ovaries, then it has another testis, then it has more ov One pair will get you in enough trouble. This guy, <laughs> this situation is certainly not typical of amphibians. There are fish that are naturally hermaphrodites, but not amphibians. We later showed that some of these animals grow up, even though they're genetic males, to be become completely functioning reproductive females, even though they were genetic males. We showed that in other species, the gonads look like this. So those are the testis on the top and all of that junk in the trunk on the bottom. Those are all eggs that are bursting through the surface of this male's testis. Now, I showed this to the Environmental Protection Agency because I thought they'd be interested. After all, it's the number one selling chemical in the, in, in, the, in the world at the time. And they said, well, that's not really an adverse effect that would stimulate us to reassess the chemical. Being said, the reason why it's so important, and this isn't like body shaming, but it's important to know that fat hat is not like this benign tissue. Fat is a living tissue. And one of the things that fat does is it creates an enzyme called aromatase. Aromatase produces more ins insulin in the body. I mean, not more insulin, but more estrogen in the body. And the more estrogen goes up, you're going to have issues with your, your period. 
it also steals away your vitamin D, which is also an issue in our community as well. So you mean to tell me, and that makes sense because I see a lot of overweight men that act like women, and it's because of their fat is producing more estrogen. Yeah, it does. It's true. Yeah, so, so fat creates the enzyme aromatase, and the aromatase will aromatize your testosterone into, it will convert your testosterone into estrogen. Holy, I'm about to be on it. I'll start with, um, why did you change your philosophy? Why did you go out on a limb and say, gays are accepted in heaven? Something that the black church disagrees with. Well, not only the black church, the church disagrees with it. And my gay friends, and I have several over the years, were some of the most sensitive, loving, creative, ingenious, generous people. Some are members of my family. Uh, I got tired of sending them to hell. It was the hell issue. I, they're going through it now, but these brilliant human beings spending eternity in, in a customized torture chamber, you know, it, it, was a, it messed with my theology and my heart. And so I started preaching the gospel of inclusion, saying that Hindus, Muslims, Jews, everybody has access to the grace of the God we preach. And that not only a few Christians were going to heaven, and that's what got me in trouble with church. They, the devotion to the devil... <laughs> And hell is stronger or as strong as anybody's devotion to Jesus in many of the Christian circles. I'm sick and tired of y'all using the Bible to veil your homophobia, right? Because in the same section of the Bible that y'all love to quote, which is Leviticus, uh, you know, it also says that you shouldn't wear mixed fabric. And it also says you shouldn't wear uh, eat shellfish either. And I don't see y'all coming after the seafood eaters and the pescatarians with the same anger that you do with homosexuals. And I don't see all the fashionistas that show up to church being put out the church and ridiculed the same way you do the gay people. Let's just say hypothetically, I am of the belief that it is in the sin, it's a sin and it's in the Bible and so on and so forth. Then it would seem to me that the church is exactly where I'm supposed to be, right? So no. miss me with the whole it's in the Bible crap because you're full of and you're homophobic. And God said to me, here's the problem. You guys in the church can be so hypocritical. He said, in the African-American church, you really got to be careful. I said, what do you mean? He said, because you are guilty of condemning the Supreme Court system and preaching against something. But if you look at half of our choirs, And a great number of our artists that we call abominations and we call demons we demonize and dehumanize the same people that we use and we don't say nothing about the quick gay choir director because he's good for business as long as the choir sound good I ain't saying nothing about his sexuality We have done what the slave master did to us, dehumanize us, uh, degrade us, demonize us, but then use them for our advantage. It's hypocritical to talk about the Supreme Court and calling them Sodom and Gomorrah, which is not what it's all about. But if that's the case, half our churches have been Sodom and Gomorrah for a hundred years. He told me, boy, you got to re-examine yourself. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, on one hand, you quote homosexuality is an abomination from Leviticus. But you say that right after you ate some shrimp, some catfish, and some lobster. You quote Leviticus while you're wearing a wool blend suit. It's also in Leviticus that you shouldn't wear mixed linens. It's in Leviticus that if your wife is on her cycle, that you shouldn't go in the same house with her or even sleep on the same bed with her. That's in Leviticus too. Here's my point. We pick and choose the scriptures that we want to use to beat folk up with rather than look at our own lives.
Let me tell you something. If God wanted to judge America, he wouldn't need the Supreme Court system. If he wanted to judge America because of sin, he would judge me in 88 at the Freaknik in Atlanta. Y'all ain't saying nothing to me. Look at your neighbor and tell your neighbor, I don't condemn you. I don't judge you. I'm going to preach Christ to you. Because you can't evangelize and antagonize at the same time. You cannot insult and inspire the same people that you insult. I thank God that Jesus went to Samaria with a woman who had some sexual identity problems and didn't preach condemnation. He just preached Christ. And our greatest missionary opportunity is going to be finding those who may be struggling to say, I'm not better than you, but the same grace that saved me, the same blood that let me come is the same blood that you're going to need. What are we going to do about the people who've been born this way? Who've been struggling with something? What about the people that we think are nasty? These folks are abomination. They're nasty. Tell you what you do then. Go find every song that's been written by a gay person for the last hundred years and don't sing it in church. Let's see how many songs you can minister on that Sunday. Bishop, don't tell me what the Bible says about homosexuals and you change wives like we change underwear. Sit yourself, your hypocritical self down. We all got to look at ourselves. We all need Jesus. You've talked about this as well. The issue of being a black gay man, especially in the church, yeah. and, and, and a man within ministry, gospel music. Um, there have been allegations that have come forward. There have been individuals that have come forward and said, I'm gay, and have been completely shut out of the yeah. black church because of that. Why is, it, why is it so unacceptable to be a black man and to be gay and to, and to lead a flock? Why is it so taboo? Well, first of all... It's not just biblical. I mean, there's a cultural of feeling course. here. Yeah, that, that's for white folks. See, y'all are supposed to do all that kind of stuff. <laughs> we don't do that kind of stuff. <laughs> we, we real men. Um, there, that's, I said that in jest, but that's no, an but that's underlying... interesting. That's what's going on. Yeah, that's a, we don't do weird stuff. Now, the other hip, 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 hypocritical aspect of that is our churches, Kira are filled with same gender loving people from the from the music department to the pulpits black music church music where would it be without our same gender loving or gay musicians and singers not all of them are but many of them have come to you and said i'm gay but i can't come oh, out oh yes oh and yeah we're talking very powerful people within yes, the gospel industry yes I've ma'am met them. yes ma'am with tears in their eyes, they were afraid. There are people who come to me and say, I embrace your gospel of inclusion, Bishop, but I can't. It's not a theological issue with me. It's a business decision. I'll lose my flock. I'll use my money. I'll lose my parsons. I'll lose myself. I can't love everybody. I can't even love me, he would say. And I want to, I want to say to that group, and this is a wake-up call. Until the church, the church, black or otherwise, confronts, not combats, confronts this issue of human sexuality, and homosexuality, which is not going away. Homosexuals and homosexuality is not going on away. If every gay person in our churches left, or those who have an orientation or a preference or an inclination or fantasy, if everyone left, we wouldn't have, we wouldn't have a church. <laughs> this is, that's interesting. Yeah, there but are gay doctors, police officers, attorneys. Pre Look at the whole Catholic church. All this idea of celibacy, it's not even natural. Um, but it's, it's out. It's like the Christian church is having to confront its issues. It's, it's platonic, plastic, superficial, uh, 
portrayals of an angry God, a vicious God, an eternal place where everybody's going to burn, and this God with this terrible anger management problem who's going to get you, and then he's going to turn you over to the devil who, who's going to accuse you to him. And it's just, it's fairy tale stuff. But we bought into it, and now we're having to face the fact that maybe we missed it on many of these issues. Um, there are a couple of things that came up for me. I, I have always for some time been awed by how engaged um, church, and particularly I can say as a, uh, the, the progeny of classical Pentecostals, how engaged church is in sex, in sexuality. Uh, deeply engaged. In, in fact, on the pantheon, in the pantheon of sin, okay, our conversations around conservative uh, uh, circles, even in this election cycle, what is it that conservatives are pushing against? Uh, um, marriage equality, um, transgender folks, uh, abortion. It's, it's something that either is sexual or is an outcome of sex. It's just like sex. It is just so on the minds and in the hearts. Of, and especially if it looks like people are having a lovely time in any way engaged in anything that is sexual. And I said, you know, it seems that we ascribe in this country and some other countries as well, but also in the churches that raised us with this predisposition that sex is supposed to be confined to misery um, and just misery. And if you are not miserable and if you are having flights of fancy or engaging in something that everybody else doesn't approve of, the only way to get you under control is to send you to hell. I find it, I find it um, incredible because it created closets. Um, and I have said, and I will say it again, everything I know in the truest sense of the word about human sexuality, I learned it in church, mm. from church people. That's where I got my training. Some of you all got your training too. Your foundational realities <laughs> happen <laughs> in church and you may have taken your gifts and skills somewhere else afterward, but you got your foundational fundamental basic training <laughs> in church. And I have said to some of my friends that are out in the world, you know, in the world, that they don't know what they're doing. I said, you all have no idea. You have no concept. You just have no idea, okay? This is what y'all doing, they're gonna hold a cup to what it is that has happened in and around religion because oppression leads to obsession. And there is something always, I don't know, more titillating about closets. And in those environments, those were the places where you could sit on the row, down the row from someone that you've been with and never glance at them. You know what I mean? But send, and send out a message and they send out a message and everybody knows the language that knows the language and nobody else knows the language who <laughs> doesn't know the language. And so, and so it is. And then I'll leave this because I want this conversation to continue. This obsession with sex um, has a lot to do with a poor theology about human sexuality. And, and I think we need to get it right. I think we've been fooling around with it too long. And I even have a certain weariness about folks. I put them in sort of the same categories, the people who extend grace and say, well, honey, you know, forgiveness is available for you. Repent and be reconciled. And the people who extend hate. Because sometimes the grace is just a kind hate. And, and until we get it right, the most we can do is say, well, you know, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God and uh, just be repent, repent, be reconciled. That is not the real work. The real work is going to be done around the theologies. It's going to be done around a better and more thorough understanding of the garden of God as it relates to human sexuality. It's going to be done around getting rid of poor scripture analysis. We're gonna to have to set Jesus free because we have a whole Jesus that we say is completely human who is not given any intimacy at all. 
How does that work? How do we justify a grown man who had no intimacy? He's not given intimacy at all. He laughed, he cried, he got mad, he was murdered, but he was never given any intimacy. How does that work? So we got a lot of work to do. Can I trust gender person who changed their whole body? Let's say it's a woman or a man completely change their body then they come to christ they still have even the feelings of their old life are they going to make it to heaven when god saves you what does he save so your salvation has nothing to do with your body <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So the issue is Christians have been stuck on your mistake. They think your outward is what God is saving. This body is going to the dust. It doesn't mean God is tolerating or accepting sin. He hates sin, but he has a provision for it. The salvation is of the soul. You don't get saved because of your body. You get saved because of your soul. And you don't get saved because you're good. You're saved because Jesus is good. There are people who have made salvation of the flesh and it has nothing to do with the flesh. Salvation of the soul. It is the soul that goes to hell. It is the soul that goes to heaven. So when God is coming after you, he's not coming after your body, he's coming after your soul. Not that he's ignoring what you did in the body, but what you're doing in the body is the side effect of sin in the soul. So why would God punish the body yet the body is being used by the soul? If somebody was in the LGBTI, whatever the alphabets are. <laughs> whatever they were, if they were in, no, I'm, be, I'm being serious. I don't know what they are. They keep changing. If they were in that lane and God rescued them, the feelings don't go away because it's something that the flesh got used to. There are people who get completely free from that. And there are people who still struggle with the feelings. And some of them were so far gone that they cannot be with a regular partner anymore. Maybe they mutilated their body parts and whatever. They can't be with somebody anymore. Does that mean that then what will be their solution? If their feelings are there, because you have to remember that we are in a fallen world. There are children that are literally born with those desires. Mm -hmm. Because if you can think about it like this. A child. Or you want to, where did that savage side, that savage side come from? Because there is an inherent nature of sin already in everybody. So the child knows anger, knows how to attack and hurt you for taking their thing. Not, uh, I don't know what taking your thing is. I thought we should all share. No. Babies know already how to fight for what is theirs because of the inherent nature of sin. If you have raised kids, you know what I'm saying to be true. They'll fight amongst themselves. They'll fight with you for saying, no, it gets crazy. Excuse me. So somebody who, just because, let me say something like this, just because you are saved, Holy Ghost filled, doesn't mean you don't have the desire to do certain things. He didn't take it away. He may have calmed you down, but he did not take it away. That's why no one is beyond sin. So a person like that, their only solution is to make themselves a unique for the kingdom of God, to abstain for the glory of God. Because you can't make somebody marry and in them, the desire to marry is not there. Mm. So they will make themselves eunuchs. If they cannot perform the duties they need to be like a husband because, or a wife because they changed their body, how can they be sane? They have to become eunuchs. They will treat themselves for the kingdom of God because salvation is not of the body, it's of the soul. It grieves me that we, we treat people the way we do once we find out that they stop impersonating who they who they aren't, and uh, the imposters are falling away. What? No, you don't go to hell for being homosexual. 
but committing homosexual acts will go to, get you to go to hell? No, wait a minute, wait, wait. wait, wait. Right. No, because you know, so, some people will well, say, no, yeah. well, it's not the homosexuality or being gay, it's being doing gay stuff. No, That's the problem. No. No, I, first of all, heterosexuality does not get you to heaven. I happen to know this. <laughs> I can tell you one of the biggest shockers is when people get to heaven, they will be shocked who is in heaven and who is not. Are gay people going to hell? No, not because they're gay. Everybody, we go to hell because we choose to reject the grace of God. The so, only way you can go so to hell gay, is if you reject the If a gay reject, person accepts, accepts Christ. Jesus Christ, he's going to heaven. Okay. Without a doubt. Okay. Well, this email comes from Ginger. And she says, after discovering our son's negative views of Christianity and the Bible, he states he is a gay Christian and wrote that he does not believe it is a sin. He feels that his homosexual lifestyle is normal and believes God will accept him. Can he get into heaven while practicing this lifestyle? I'm glad you asked this question. Lots of people would like to have an answer. To answer your question, can a person who is a homosexual go to heaven? If they have been saved by the grace of God, yes. If they have been saved by the grace of God, yes. Because my relationship with God and coming back into the church over the past year and a half is one of the greatest gifts that has been given to me in terms of being in this movement. So, so, so my question, and my question to everybody who tries to say that Oh, you shouldn't be, you know, Christian because you're gay. Why are you trying to turn people away from God? That's why I think Christians need to befriend more non-Christians and uh, invite themselves into their circles, not necessarily go to a gay pride parade, but befriend people that don't go to your church and don't look like you and don't have the same sexual preference as you. And I think from that place, we can both come to an understanding which will make everything a lot more practical. Community. So do you, do you think, I'm assuming, uh, the LGBT community and the black church can coexist? Absolutely. I, I, let me push that question, because that, that's sort of an obvious yes. Church ain't turning nobody away. How should the black church and the LGBT community exist? I think it's going to be diverse from church to church. Every church has a different opinion on the issue, and every gay person is different. And I think that to, to speak the church, the black church or white church or any kind of church you want to call it, are all the same is totally, totally not true. And all gay people are not the same. The, the, the types of relationships that are afforded are based on the types of people in each individual case. Yeah. And LGBTs of wipes and sorts have to find a household of worship that reflects what your views are and what you believe like anybody else. And the church should have the right to have its own convictions and values. If you don't like those convictions and values, you totally disagree with it, don't try to change my house, move into your own and, and establish that sort of thing and find somebody who gets what you get about faith. And uh, trust me, I've talked to enough LGBT, they are not all the same. Oh, for sure. To you with intentionality, I wanna pray for your home church. The church you were saved in. The church you were raised in. The church that introduced you to Jesus. The church where you learned the Lord's Prayer. The church where you sang in the first choir. Because that church is robbed of your creativity. Do you know how much better your church would be if they had your contribution, if they had your offering? Do you lift up that hand, please? Do you lift up that hand, please? Lord, I pray. Would you speak the name of your home church out loud? Speak the name of your home church out loud. I pray that your grace will be sufficient. That your mercy will break in. I pray, dear Lord, that you'll transform that ministry Come on, man. so that they will be relevant for the 21st century. I pray for a hedge fence of protection for those who are hostage to that ministry. They're no longer being fed, they're not being affirmed, they're being ostracized and castigated, but they stay there because their mother goes there, because their grandmother is there. Because their father is the pastor. God, I pray for revival to break out. God, arise and let our enemies be scattered. 
I pray for the bloodstained banner to now infuse that church so that they will realize that they have missed an opportunity to love. But God, give them another chance. I thank you for it. Thank you, dear Lord, for loving us when we had to leave that church. Thank you for keeping your hand on us when they would not lay hands on us. Thank you, dear Lord, for elevating us when they tried to put us out and put us down. God, we give you glory that we didn't commit suicide. We give you glory that we are not in an insane asylum. We give you glory that we're not in the bottom of drugs and alcohol. We give you glory that we still love ourselves and value ourselves. We give you glory that you knew beyond all of our thoughts. You need us at our knees. For that we give your name praise. We give your name thanksgiving. Come on and clap your hands for what God has done. To my closeted LGBT folks in the room. Closets, especially church closets, are unfit for human growth and habitation. Closets are musty. They have no windows. They are dark. They are created for storage. They're not there for living people. I want to welcome you to the light, and I encourage you to break out, bust out, come out, come out, come out, come out. There's fresh air over here. Come out. We're waiting for you. We've got some good things to share with you. Come on out of there. There's a whole community that will love you. Not all of the views expressed in this video are the views of the video creator. However, T.S. Holder does pray and hope that through the different opinions, perspectives, scientific facts, sermons, and prayers displayed, that your perspective towards the LGBTQIA plus community has been enlightened and positively altered to recognize and realize that LGBTQIA plus is not just an acronym but letters that encompass a vast population of living people who deserve respect, acceptance, affirmation, and more importantly, love. Please feel free to leave your constructive comments, subscribe, hit the notification bell, and above all, please share this video. Thank you for your time.